Webinar is now live. All right. Greetings, everyone. And uh, thank you so much for joining in on this very eventful Thursday afternoon. I am Samantha LaDuc, founder of LaDucTrading.com. And I have here on the screen share a little macro to micro power hour reminder that on Tuesdays and Thursdays, we talk macro and micro, meaning the backdrop, obviously, of what's happening in market structure and, oh gosh, the economy at large and how it translates into particular actionable trades and also when to be on alert for risks. And I think today is a perfect day to talk about risks in this particular subject matter. I am very uh, happy to be joined by uh, two gentlemen who have done this with me before. And if you recall back in January, end of January, I hosted a SPAC attack uh, macro to pow micro power hour wherein these two gentlemen joined uh, Craig Samuels and George um, Kaufman or Kaufman, forgive me, um, in regards to talking about the power of these special purpose um, you know, asset corporations that are just absolutely cut, catching fire. And now the question is, will they catch fire because of a new rate regime, interest rate regime? But I had done this. It got extremely um, solid reviews and we decided to do a follow-up. So here we are the very end of February. And if you want to go um, Leduc Trading and just search under SPAC, you will see I have posted uh, a write-up that I did for clients, as well as the video that we did um, back in January. And there were some uh, macro considerations that at the time didn't merit any attention, but I would say that they're front and center now. Um, in particular, these you know liquidity vehicles that promise a risk-free rate of return, um, but you know this this does come at a um, a time where. Then we had very low rates, and in the span of a month and a few weeks, we have exploded higher in our, uh, not only the steepening of the yield curve, but also just across the board, especially the five-year um, uh, yield. And so we are with inflation expectations, et cetera, et cetera. But the point is that, as I reminded, this SPAC euphoria seems to time inversely with another anomaly. When inflation expectations are factored in, investment grade corporate bonds now have a negative real yield for the first time in history, which was really, really exciting, okay? Now let's fast forward. We have got positive real yields and they are climbing. So I will skip out of this and just remind you that when this is done, a little housekeeping, we're gonna post this video right here under Macro to Micro Power Hour. And this is my YouTube channel. It is where I talk on Tuesdays with Jonathan Gibbons of VigTech IO. We just talked about rates, interest rates, why they matter. Um, so it's perfect timing to do a SPAC attack too, because there are still tons of opportunities in this space, not a question, but there are also rising risks. And I really want to talk about the macro backdrop um, with, that, uh, with that framing. So. YouTube channel, that's where we're gonna upload this video when we're done. Again, I do this on Tuesdays and Thursdays. This is um, really an honor, gentlemen, to have you join. Craig Samuels is founder of Samuels Capital Management and has been inv in, involved in the SPAC space, um, but generally trading and investing for a long time, let's just say a long time. And in particular, um, introduced me to George because he has been writing these deals since about 2003. So they're both, in my opinion, subject matter experts from both from the deal making to the trading of these deals and the due diligence that Craig has done. And last time he gave us a whole bunch of actionable trades um, that he was in, directly invested in um, and so that's definitely what I want to, you know, revisit, gentlemen, not only the trades that you had recommended, Craig, but also the macro environment that we spoke of, um, George, and I want to get your thoughts now. Here we are. We are, you know, just coming off a closing bell with one of the largest global income, uh, you know, rate yield spikes and fixed in global fixed income uh, drama in years. I mean, not since like 2003. 
in the late 1990s did we have this kind of explosion um, in yields. So I would really like to first get your thoughts, George, on how is this viewed in your business as the macro risks are rising? Sure, uh, and Samantha, thanks for having me again. Um, the, look, as we said last time, and as is, is the case historically, uh, a steepening curve, but more importantly, rising real rates tend to have muted Im muting impacts on the equity markets. And ultimately a SPAC is a bridge to the equity markets for any company combining with, with the SPAC itself. So um, it'll likely show up, uh, though, it, though it hasn't shown up yet in terms of deal-making activity, it'll likely show up provided this trend continues um, in a slower pace of announcement. That's mm -hmm. the most likely result as um, as elevated equity values may be more challenging for companies uh, attempting to to debut in this market, um, and it's a, it's largely based on psychology that um, those elevated equity valuations tend to become expected, and so um, over a period of time, a lower set of ex um, of values have to have to be acceptable for the deal making to come through. The, the other obvious impact, at least in the near term, has been um, some sharp reversals in some of the uh, higher profile, um, more speculative but exciting names that had announced and or closed with SPACs recently. And that's just symptomatic with other, um, with other uh, growth names that, that are acting the same way in the equity markets in general. So at this point, because I was just bringing up, um, hold on one second, where would the deals right now that have exploded recently, SPAC capital raised years to date. Um, it, when I did this was February 20th, so five days ago, they had raised already five, 50 billion. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions you know, folks are asking is how long can this run last? We'll, we'll definitely talk about what vehicles have the most opportunity and which ones, Craig, I'm sure you're sizing up now are gonna be most potential for shorting. I know you do both, so this is perfect. But I mean, the, the, the deal flow for normal IPOs in a normal year is 200 to 250 and the SPACs already by the 20th had brought in 50 billion. So you're saying that this will most likely, especially now with this interest rate regime kind of slow the, the number of deals. Um, will it also help increase maybe the quality? Because everybody <laughs> was coming in to, to price, you know, before, yeah. you know, like I, Bloomberg yeah, um, just two days ago reported that there were 146 SPACs ready to raise an additional 40 billion. And that was just in one week. I've, I've been tweeting for two weeks, three weeks, supply and capital letters. It's ludicrous, and not only has supply increased to, to an exponential number, but the unit itself for us has gotten a little bit riskier because instead of half or three quarter and some of the, the deals that George floats, full warrants, we've seen more deals with either no warrant or an eighth of a warrant or a fifth of a warrant. They're kind of like throwing the dog a bone. Speaking yet, of which. <laughs> yet the, the insiders, right? Those, those uh, founding management team, they continue to buy five, six, seven, eight million shares for 25,000. Plus they agreed to buy warrants, dollar fifty warrants, so five to $10 million worth. And I think George, you can you can correct me if I'm wrong, but their their cost basis, given that situation, both the uh, warrant purchase and the founder shares, is typically around four dollars. Is that right? Um, I just spoke to a team that was uh, seeking my investment as a founder, and and the blended spread based on a few different scenarios seemed to be anywhere from five fifty down to the lowest I saw on the spreadsheet was about four dollars. So, so, so SPAC math is, is interesting. It's exciting for those who are sponsors and that's been a primary driver of the interest in, um, 
in sponsorship across the, the sector. Um, it depends on the size of the SPAC because the larger the SPAC, the, the lower the impact of the fees of establishing, forming and floating the SPAC. But on average, um, on average, the sponsor cost basis is closer to a dollar. Well, I'm glad that I shot that opportunity down. <laughs> the, the spreadsheet they showed me was around four to five fifty, and I said thanks, but no thanks. How okay. about more of the? How about more of the uh, point zero zero <laughs> <laughs> zero one paper, <laughs> not the four to five fifty paper? There's been a healthy market in syndicating SPAC sponsor participation for about the last three years, but it's really accelerated in the last year or so, obviously, um, it, obviously in light of the post-business combination price performance. And um, different types of investors have different risk uh, profiles and different will accept different valuations for, for their participation. Um, it's pretty rare to see sponsors share the true cost basis. They do, they do a fair bit of work to get these things floated and they're, and they're trading on their reputation, which has value. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it comes down to each and every individual to decide what valuation is appropriate for them to have as an entry point. And um, I think that it's fair to say that the institutional involvement in supporting sponsors has found a level somewhere in the two range. We've seen higher and lower, but it's somewhere in the two range. Um, and we have seen some retail participation north of that. This used to be all over the board. Um, there was no real paradigm. It's coalescing into, into those sort of ranges. Do you have any figures on, you know, the, of the SPACs that have, you know, come to market, especially in the past few years, and I do mean like 2015 maybe? Um, what's the, the return? For the sponsor? Collect yeah, collectively. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, is there any data on that as far as an asset class? So for the sponsors, so so um, not for the sponsor, for the vehicle post for the post for the investors or the sponsors. They're very different risk profiles and very different return profiles. So oh, and it depends on the date of measurement. So if you think about the the topic that that you guys like to focus on, which I think is the most important one, which is what's what are the open market, often IPO, but not always IPO investors um, return profiles over the last five years, six years, it's accelerated dramatically. So in uh, previ uh, previous to 2020, the average return on SPACs moved from, um, for it depends on the strategy as well, but uh, purchasing in the IPO, holding the unit, trading it, ultimately likely not participating through mm -hmm. the business combination. So not uh, not exposing um, the holder to either downside or upside post um, post elimination of the, the SPAC protections. The yield profile on an annualized basis, on an unlevered annualized basis, to be clear, mm -hmm. uh, because most institutions are actually levered to a degree. Mm -hmm. uh, so was ranged between five and 8%. So it was generally better than, um, we've been in a very low interest rate environment for a very long time, of course. It was generally substantially better than the same treasuries that underlie the common. Uh, and that's what, that's what attracted the initial institutional capital to it as, as the industry grew. In, we, as we discussed last time, in 2020, we saw a real shift. We, that shift was primarily driven by retail interest in, in the vehicle. Mm -hmm. institutional interest was already there, but also by the largest institutions who had been staying away to a degree, becoming very active in business combination financing, although still not, not participating in IPOs at scale. And that I think gave the street um, confidence that higher quality, more interesting, uh, potentially longer leg companies were merging into these vehicles, um, which was clearly part of the, the upside. So, in, in 2020, the unlevered return for a similar strategy to the one that I just described mm -hmm. um, was north of 20% across all SPACs. And of course, include SPACs that didn't close because they had launched too recently or, or hadn't found the target that they had sought. That's an average that's not picking and choosing between teams. We're certainly aware of many of our clients um, who 
uh, who seek to participate at larger scale in certain teams and lower scale in other teams um, generated returns um, at nearly 100%. Again, still really investing in treasuries. And that's, that's been the appeal to a lot of, a lot of institutions. Though, though the scale of the market dictates that largest institutions can't pick and choose to that degree. And, um, and you, you have to be nimble and relatively smaller to generate 100% returns. Um, uh, it's, it's not a fully institutional strategy if you're, if you're deploying, if the market is, um, is, can now facilitate billions, um, and, but you're trying to put to work that scale of capital. Unfortunately, you don't have the option to, to truly focus only on certain ones, but, but deploying single digit billions and, um, and uh, hundreds of millions has, has now made that available. Okay, so, and, and do you also, I mean, right now there are a lot of um, imitators and a lot, a lot of potential crap issues that are coming into this space now because of this flood of supply. And Craig's been, you know, definitely tweeting about this the past few weeks going, this is getting ludicrous as far as, the, you know, the amount of- Making you know, me mad. What? Making, making you mad. mad. You're making your beautiful like asset class that you've been trading in and out of with precision and helping a lot of people also with your picks and your due diligence that you're sharing. Um, and now it's becoming dubious, right? It's just like, it's being a little bit of a, um, a poster child of uh, greed and hubris and celebrity <laughs> CEOs and Wall Street. And it's like, oh, now the retail, you thought they had an edge. They were coming into something that typically was only for right? Institutional um, investment management, you know, deals. And now they're like, ah, oh, you're ruining it for us because too much, too, too much shininess. So okay. how, how are you navigating that? Because you can see it. So silly. Yeah. So, so I highlighted it a few weeks ago. I posted a chart of the NASDAQ. Uh, I was growing increasingly concerned with the gross speculation you know, historically, I've, I've maintained anonymity. I'm not, uh, I don't share much about what I do uh, online. Um, and Twitter has been interesting because as I've gained uh, a larger following, although it's still relatively small relative to the gurus, um, I see the attacks increasing. So, for instance, the other day, you know, I think somebody fired a, a shot at my head because I had something to say about Kathy Wood and the ARC funds. Well, I mean, ARC fund is a classic example of, of uh, what I deem to be irresponsible investing, right? It's, it's a fund that has a significant amount of capital, and they're just throwing it in the market because that's probably what they have to do by their charter. So for instance, you see a SPAC announcement and suddenly they're buying massive positions the next day. Well, you know, I come out of the old school regime of, of research where we contacted the company directly. We contacted competitors. We actually flew to see if the company existed, if there, if there was uh, inventory sitting on a dock, et cetera, right? And by just barreling in, you can see the irresponsible amount of due diligence. I would wager, you know, very little to none. And, and I've taken the other side of that trade, which I, you know, I, I'm not a paid for service. And, and I, I only talk about risk. It's my biggest concern is risk. And so I, the ideas I post on Twitter are what I believe to be relatively low risk and good upside in, in the SPAC space. It's all been, you know, very strong teams. And I think since our last um, SPAC attack one, I, I don't have the number, but it's definitely north of 20 that I talked about that have mm -hmm. all hit. Well, it, but like you said, the supply of hits driving also that supply of new issues and, and right, you know, coming to market, it's feeding on itself. You'll be relieved when it slows down. Are you worried with the, the rate no, regime no, change I mean, that we have? No, no, I think the SPAC look I've been doing this, George has been doing it since 17 years already. So the best, what, what makes me happy is that 
George doesn't have to convince sellers about the vehicle. It's widely accepted now, right? You've got DraftKings, you've got Lucid Motors, you've got big household brand name entities public via this vehicle. So I think the sales process is probably a hell of a lot easier, right, George? Yeah, well, look, for, for, for nearly a decade and a half, <laughs> primary challenge in this space, uh, as a sponsor and as a banker, because effectively we're on the same side from that perspective, was educating targets as to why they would choose this as opposed to a tr traditional IPO or a strategic sale or a private equity sale. And I, I agree with Craig that that fortunately has been solved and, and the institutional acceptance is clear. Um, now the question is at what valuation are deals gonna get done in, mm -hmm. a, in a declining equity market? And I really do, historically that comes down to psychological acceptance of, of market conditions and they tend to trail. So uh, rising markets are typically great for deal making because if, uh, if a company wants to go public and their anticipated uh, valuation is X, but the market moves up 3% a month or in more recent cases has been considerably higher. Um, by the time the deal closes, the market's substantially higher. Interest investors are, public market investors tend to take pretty close to that and the private valuation stayed, um, stayed uh, where it was. That, that dynamic obviously reverses in a declining market. And we've done a, a number of uh, um, analysis over the years that show that at the peak, deal making continues until it starts to uh, form a true trend. And then deal making does, uh, does abate considerably. And it, and it doesn't really pick up again until um, uh, at the same pace, it doesn't go away. And, and again, SPACs can be, SPACs can be company's best friends going public in a market that doesn't support IPOs at all. So their, their use case ultimately is, uh, is um, broad and, and really, really supportive of capital markets activity, even in, in uh, lesser markets. But the, the true volume of transactions doesn't typically return until you hit the bottom of the curve again and you start to see reset valuation expectations aligning better with, with market multiples. Yeah, on that note, I think one of my concerns, which I've also highlighted publicly, is expect investor expectation. And historically, and George, correct me if I'm wrong, from IPO to announcement has been somewhat in the in the one year range. Whereas now we've we've seen deals in less than two months. And investor expectation is off the charts for deal announcement and subsequent closure. And I think what you've seen this week is a sudden shift whereby common shares that were trading in the, as high as I think 15, 16, I mean, I sold a bunch of GSAH in the mid 15s is coming down, I mean, down 7% to 1180. Supernova, everybody's expecting Spencer Raskoff to announce the deal, right? Because he filed for two additional SPACs the shares have declined from 1220 to 1084. The list goes on and on. And I consistently write, be disciplined and don't chase. Like the, the concept of, of trading a SPAC is foreign to me. And I've used almost every rumor announcement to sell a significant position portion of my position or all of it. So for instance, GSAH, gone. Uh, everybody's cheering lots of these deals that you know I recommended at the within a day of IPO, including reInvent, the, the Reed Hoffman deal that announced Joby yesterday. And you know, I again I come from a deep value background and paying $10 billion for something that hasn't flown uh, a single human, you know, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. And companies. Uh, so since value is your focus for sure, and I've seen you, you know, for lack of a better word, trade in and around these issues that you have already done due diligence on, mm -hmm. but do you, do you equate this particular wave right now of SPAC euphoria um, you know, to 1999, 2000, often being compared. Oh, sure. Okay, so for sure. 
and maybe misaligned incentives with so many others coming online that are really just taking advantage of the euphoria um, a la 2000. So our, this will not go away as an asset class. Neither of you are saying that, but just no how, how much of a, of a pullback would you expect? Uh, I'm hard to say I, because you've got so many issues right now that you are tracking night and day. 500. Almost well, 500. 500. Almost you're, you're spending ungodly amounts of hours trying to keep hours up. 14 hours a day right now. <laughs> I'm not happy. You're not happy. <laughs> yeah. But, okay, so uh, what's going to, in your opinion, on, on that whole, like, you, um, sentiment play of SPACs, rates obviously are on a completely new tear, right, since we last talked in January. Very impressive. Um, how much of this is going to fail, in your opinion, like percentage-wise of these deals that you think oh. are really just not going to happen now? Yeah, so I think what we'll start to see, is, as George mentions, is timeline to deal will, will lengthen, right? Sellers got greedy. So they believe that their asset, which may be worth, let's just for argument's sake, say a billion, they believe it's suddenly worth 3 billion. Why? Because SPAC teams with a cost basis of a dollar are willing to pay that. And your basis, our basis is north of 10. So our interests are mi misaligned. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the seller has to realize, okay, I need to come down because the buyer can only pay so much because the SPAC will get a no vote, right? Everybody will redeem their $10 share when it doesn't go up. And, and seller psychology has to shift that now that billion dollar asset is worth two, you know, we'll take two billion. It's still a billion more than it's worth but a billion less than we were going to get last week. But the sentiment- and That's a process. Really, yeah, that's a process, but, a it, process. It, but it's still, you're saying sustainable and durable because ultimately, I mean, not just, you know, private equity has a lot of money on the sidelines. I've read 2 trillion, you know, they're, they're putting, and retail has exposure to this kind of private equity wave in I'm high saying. growth. Yeah, high growth. Companies, this is exciting for retail to have, to be able to come to the table and play and stay at the table. Um, so it's exciting until you're cut in half. Then it's not so exciting. That's trading. <laughs> you know, we've that's all been there. Investing. Hmm. But if, again, if you, there's 500 names to choose from, we're not going to get them all right. The goal is to minimize risk and maximize reward. You stick to the discipline, which is to buy units closer, as close to 10 as possible with good, respectable teams. We make money, period, on a deal announcement, 10% or more. And that strategy, look, rates have backed up with the 10 years still 1.5 in the 30s, 2.3 in real time. So great, they've backed up, but mom and dad can't live on on their fixed income portfolio, despite the backup, which means that there's still money chasing, ultimately chasing stocks and ultimately buying SPACs. And- Which SPACs? Because now that we've talked about, yes, there's a risk of this being very, you know, 1999-like, um, there's gonna be much more focus on, or I would say concentration on the highest probability and most notable celebrity CEO. So it, yes, since we last did this, you had a whole bunch of just bullseye hits in um, deal picking and you continue to, to ride this wave of, of you know 500 names. Do you have a short list? I mean, I've seen obviously some of your tweets, some have who are in this, um, uh, this webinar and who will watch it afterward for sure but definitely want to talk about some of those names. And then some you're really cautious of this are like just, they're phony. They're more likely not going to make it. But first, let me just ask, um, answer this. Jonathan just piped in. Are there any cases in which you don't sell out most of all of your position at the merger announcement pop? So there are some like mechanical oh, questions yeah. in here we need to, we need yeah, to ask as well. 
But before we get to that, um, I, I had received a request um, to discuss rights. Okay. And I think George can answer that because that's within the, the, the structure. So let's move into that before we talk ideas because that'll- Got it. Um, okay, where was that? George, you wanna talk about rights? Sure, rights. Uh, so there's, there's, there's a unit equals a common and a warrant typically. And in some circumstances, a third piece of the puzzle called a right. Yeah. So, so the traditional structure of a unit for a SPAC, as as Craig noted, is um, is a, a share of a common and some fraction of a warrant, and that's that's been the way SPACs have been priced for a very long time. Um, it, years ago, another instrument was was introduced. It's called a share right, and it's an <clears throat> It's a fraction of a share that's attached to the unit, trades separately, and it converts into a share of the surviving company uh, at, at some ratio. So the traditional ratio is a tenth. There have been other ratios, but today, if there's a right, it's almost certainly a tenth, which means that um, the value of the right is based on the expected value of the uh, trading price of the stock for the surviving company uh, divided by 10. The interesting thing about the right, I think for those who are interested in trading around them is that they don't have the type of upside traditionally as a warrant because they don't convert on a one-for-one -one basis for each point that the stock would move, meaning, um, meaning the warrant is um, uh, continues to be more and more in the money on a point by point basis for each, for each uh, point that the surviving stock or even the existing pre-business um, pre combination stock will move. But the right itself is always only uh, convertible into a 10th of a share. So it only moves a 10th. The difference though, is that um, the right is worth a 10th of the share, even if the stock goes down. And of course, uh, uh, warrants, which which have some similarity to options, though they're not the same, uh, have both time uh, have both time value and intrinsic value, and time is really also rel related to the the opportunity. But the right doesn't have those things, um, so it really just trades as a, uh, in most cases, much like a warrant initially on the probability of any team doing a deal, which which would then take it to the stock price divided by ten, and then no alpha beyond that. It simply is a tenth of the share. From the SPAC sponsor's perspective, uh, they're the least, they have been, other than SPACs that are issued with no warrants at all, they have been the least dilutive to the target structure available. Because while, as, we, as we've discussed, a, a typical SPAC these days um, issued with a unit with a common and a third of a warrant or a quarter of a warrant. That means one third to, uh, I mean, 33% uh, to down to 25% dilution to the target company that was brought by the sponsor of the SPAC for um, essentially for any movement above the strike price, which is 1150. And so you can see that many of these companies, especially these high growth, well-supported, um, high visibility names trading close to 20, above 20 in some cases, um, that's quite a bit of dilution. They come with cash, but the cash is at 11.50. If the stock is trading at $30, I think it's more than just arguable that the company likely could have taken in that cash much closer to the stock price. That's, that's considerable dilution. The rights don't come with cash, so they are purely dilutive at all prices to the target, but they're only a tenth. And so, for those companies that think that, that they will, would express a, a high growth path, a high price appreciation, a right ends up being the least dilutive instrument that they could possibly merge with. It's automatic dilution, but it's, but it's controlled dilution. Um, and we've seen a resurgence of interest in, um, in rights as certain teams these days, Craig mentioned, have been achieving a fifth or even an eighth or even a in the case of, of a couple, a ninth and a tontine with a ninth and a two ninths, which is a whole other, other story. Um, most SPACs are pricing with somewhere between a third or a quarter these days, some, some still with a half. 
that's that's a lot of dilution and, and rights represent considerably less. So they're by an, from an investor standpoint, they're substantially less risky than a than a warrant because even a business combination that doesn't trade well trades to nine dollars, which is a broken deal for for most. Um, is the right is still worth ninety cents? A um, a, a small fraction of a warrant in the event that the it, the, the unit was issued with an eighth of a warrant or a fifth of a warrant, um, and that warrant traded down to uh, that sorry that stock traded down to nine bucks. That eighth of a warrant is is frankly almost valueless. Ten cents, fifteen cents. So in a in a riskier market. Um, rights have have a place, and um, from from an investor standpoint, in a uh, a headier market, rights have a place from the target's perspective as being the least dilutive instrument that a SPAC can bring. That was a detailed answer. I hope you got all of that. If not, check the channel after rewind, rewind. do that video portion again, because that was very detailed. Thank you, George. You know, I, I, I think a good exercise for everybody, uh, we will get a bear market. Mm. It will happen. Everybody should have a, a, a page of SPAC rights and SPAC warrants because that's where you make a lot of money. And for example, there was a, a SPAC derm tech and the common mm -hmm. was in the toilet and the warrant was nine cents. And that Eddie warrant, <laughs> that warrant, well, the, the, the stock went from 12 to 80 event ultimately, right? I'm just trying to see. Uh, so after the SPAC closed, the, the common crashed to five bucks and the warrant crashed to nothing, but the warrant went to 10 or $12 recently. That's where you get rich. One of those changes your life. Hmm. So, so it, that is everybody on this call, a couple hours, we all have pages of symbols. Make one of SPAC warrants. And when that bear market hits and lots of these SPACs break 10 and go to five or four or two or whatever, and you see those warrants at 20 cents, 30 cents. Remember, they're five-year warrants. The world will change within that five-year period. No, and they'll all point. go five to 10 times without you doing anything, okay. but shooting blindly across the board. Oh, that's going to that's gonna be a sound bite. I think a few people take um, very seriously. Are there, Jonathan does ask, are there any cases in which you don't sell out most or all of your position at the merger announcement pop? Yeah, so my strategy is not necessarily to sell. And again, I've been, I, I've tweeted about this. I, there's three options for me. Hold, buy, sell, and hold. So uh, for example, on, on uh, reInvent RTP units, I dumped the entire position. I was in early in a 10 plus billion dollar or 12, wherever it got to. For me, that's not attractive. It's too early. Will I buy it back at 12 or 11 or 10? Maybe. Depends on the market. It depends on other opportunity because I'm trying to maximize my returns. I don't care about symbols and I don't love companies. I've been doing this too long. So uh, Archer Aviation, you know, AC, I, I see which announced uh, a few weeks prior to reInvent. Um, with the SPAC name is, uh, is Atlas Crest, which I recommended on the last call is a 10 Molus deal. I think Molus has done more uh, deals than anybody in Wall Street in the $4 trillion range. And I bought a ton of this and dumped all of it uh, near the highs around 17 to 18. I think they might've traded as high as 20 pre-market. And, and then of course on Twitter, you've got people that know nothing about, about the, uh, the underlying fundamentals of, of either um, Joby or Archer debating which is better. Well, we're stock people. I went to law school. I know how to read press releases. I know how to read balance sheets. I know how to decipher income statements. 
I have no idea in 24 hours how to discern which EV helicopter is better than the than the other, better than the other one. And these debates are comical and just a sign of the froth and sentiment that makes me want to short everything. To be honest with you. Well, and you I, mean the market, I, I, not necessarily this at this particular space. You yeah, still yeah. are going to pick and choose. Yeah, because look, going forward. I'm excited if I can if I can hop in a helicopter and and be in LA in 30 minutes versus three to four hour drive from San Diego, I'm I'm game for that. So yeah, the SPAC is super exciting because, as you mentioned earlier, there's lots of late stage venture coming to market. The key is to navigate the valuation and the risk, and unfortunately, valuation is tough right now because we've never seen anything like this period in time, not even in 2000. Historically, uh, I remember when I worked for an institution, you know, we would buy software companies at one time's revenue. Like, like my micro strategy call, I posted on Twitter at 106. It had a billion dollar market cap, 500 million in cash, trading uh, and, and about 500 or 400 million in revenue. I saw zero risk in that buy, zero downside. I had no idea that they'd pivot to Bitcoin and the thing would go 13 fold in two months. Mm -hmm. But these are the types of, of ideas that I like to generate. Ditto Triple D and Stratasys and the list is endless. Well, um, these are outside the SPAC land. And yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I, I travel in that a lot, but the SPACs were something that was overwhelming. In other words, it was overstimulation and the number of deals and the supply. And my only thought was, not only does this feel like 1999, but the supply it almost feels like it's going to, it, it, that the space will be crushed by the supply. So how yeah. do you navigate within SPAC specifically when you have right. also, and George, I'm curious, you know, how you rationalize this for, um, for the doubting Thomases, if you will, you know, where sponsors either get a deal approved, I'm, I'm reading off um, a DM that I had with a, a colleague on Twitter, regarding the SPACs and the risks that aren't being talked about, misaligned incentives, if you will. Sponsors either get a deal approved and receive massive pay or fail to get a deal and lose their sponsor equity. It's, you know, like this perverse incentive driving bad behavior potentially in this space. So yeah, that, that's going to happen. I mean, that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like I know, I know the team that did ESSC as a Chinese SPAC. I know one of the board members personally, I met with them for seven years in a row all the time in Hong Kong, I, I wouldn't let the guy babysit my dog. Well, there's that and issue with truly awful companies getting truly amazing valuations. <laughs> but 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 that happens that happens outside of SPAC land. I mean, that's just of called course. Wall Street. You know, if, if, if you walk on Wall Street, you're gonna walk into a lot of rat's nests, you know, it's just, it just is what it is. So which ones right now are you still very focused on since we have this mix right now of um, a high interest rate regime combined with an oversupply. I'll go on a limb and say we are overbought, <laughs> meaning in the supply of SPACs and now market weakness because this rate volatility is absolutely spilling over into equity volatility, as I warned last week and the week before that. It's coming, it's coming. So we have this now perfect storm. Um, for a, a true test, right, of yeah. this space, you know, if we get a we get a serious continuation pull, let's put it that way, in equity markets, um, and obviously, you know, tide lifts all boats and it brings them all back. So, what about your top plays right now, and then the ones that you think are just totally bogus? I mean, we'll go from the extremes. Your very best and your yeah. Very so, worst. so look, I, I run a very broad basket of names and you move a lot and and i evaluate every deal i'm up at 3 45 a.m i work till four i eat dinner play with the dogs do whatever and then i'm back reading prospectuses and powerpoints and and analyzing these deals and again i've i've bought many post close that have you know moonshot from 15 to 30 40 50 so i don't i can't have a, a blanket statement that i sell it's unique to each deal what i've done recently is i've reallocated so for instance on the acic 
Um, I sold a bunch of that considerably higher. I, I love the deal. I'm hoping that as time moves along and I have a better understanding of both Archer and Joby, that it, uh, maybe I'll come back to it at, at 8 billion and okay, I, I sold it and I'll buy it back, right? Um, but I, for instance, on, on the Archer deal, I reallocated all of that and I bought 2X the quantity of Atlas Crest 2. So Molus's next deal. So I nearly doubled my money on one and I rolled all of it into his second deal because I felt that if he's willing to, to nab Archer, he, he knows how to find sexy concepts, which is what's worked. Um, so that's one, ACII.U. What's, what's nice about this call is lots of these units that were trading in the 11s or 12s or whatever are, are all crashing and they're all right back to where I said, I like to buy things around 10 and a half or lower. So we've de-risked a little bit, which I was concerned about coming into this conversation today because I don't like to see people lose money. That's, that's a personal thing. I like to make money and manage risk. Um, I'm hopeful that AGCUU will come a little lower. Um, this is altimeter. He's got two altimeter growth, uh, which has a fifth of a warrant, which I don't like. And then AGCB, which has no warrant. I own a boatload of both, even though I don't like that he, he hasn't given us a warrant. Why? Because he's a, he's a brilliant investor. Uh, altimeter Brad and uh, he knows the game and and I don't think he's going to put anything in either of these vehicles that isn't going to work I might be wrong but that's my bet so I really like anything altimeter I'm hoping that the, that the market indigestion here um, will cause all of these teams to maybe reconsider valuation. George, you can jump in and tell me if, uh, if deals get ratcheted down in the 11th hour or if they march ahead and, and we see a, more CCIVs where everybody's high-fiving, thinking at, at 60 it's going to 100 and then it gets cut in half fast and maybe more people wind up losing money in this deal than make money. Yeah, that's that's a really interesting question, and uh, and historically, historically deals did reprice um, in in declining and more challenging markets. We haven't seen it in a while, obviously, but but that's a market driven thing, not a spac driven thing. And that's that was the point that I was trying to make earlier: is that the, the spac flexibility ends up being the best path to public liquidity and uh, and public cash, even in bad markets. So so those targets that are that, that for some reason, often marketing or international expansion or something like that, want to be public even in less than ideal market conditions, this back is the best, best facilitator um, and allows them to be public for the, for likely for the turn so that they'll be first out of the gates and whatever their sector is often gives them the ability to use their currency, their share currency for acquisitions and that sort of thing. And, and Samantha, I just wanted to address one of the, one of the things that, that you noted and make it at least clear from, you know, from my perspective being in the space as long as I have. There's a difference between SPACs, which are vehicles backed in, in a sense by treasuries and the surviving companies. The surviving companies are standalone operating companies just like any other company that went public, no matter how they went public. The SPAC itself doesn't exist after that date. And so we're thinking about the yield profile that that um, investors can achieve by investing in SPACs. If if like Craig, they're uh, they're judicious about where they buy. They don't take too much risk. They don't, as I like to say, they don't try to cheat towards second too much. Um, the return pro profile is still on a risk reward uh, weighted basis, still the best on the street from most perspectives. Meaning, especially in low interest rate environments. What does that mean? That means. That means, okay, if a deal isn't working on the announcement, investors have the right to pull their money, sell their comments, sell their warrants, or if they're right, sell their rights. And the yield likely is um, these days, even on subdued reaction announcements, is likely to be somewhere 
between five and 10%. And, and because it's because uh, sponsor teams are moving so quickly from IPO to announcement, that could be five or 10% in three to four months. So on an annualized basis, that is tremendous. And it beats most institutional investors, most gurus in most years. And you can do that, you have been able to do that, or I should say investors have been able to generate those types of returns pretty consistently um, uh, using SPACs. And when, and, uh, when you can't, that's years. a harder deal environment. So you still have the, what has traditionally been a, a very solid downside protection in the form of the, the common share being um, invested effectively only in treasuries. And you still have the equity optionality in, in a good announcement. You still have the performance of the derivative, often the warrant. So they still end up being in less than, uh, less than the best market conditions. They still end up being the best provider of, of a return. They certainly beat equities. And, we, and the other point that I wanted to address, and then I'm, I'm always curious to hear what Craig likes and doesn't like in, in individual names. Um, um, is it look? I like Yeti. I got a bunch of them. Yeah, it's good. We, we, we're still in an ultra low rate environment. Yes, rates clearly are ticking up and there's a lot of macro themes there. Um, and maybe that will continue. But Craig's point, I think, was, was really key. You, you cannot put all your retirement income into, uh, into government treasuries and earn enough to live these days. And so there's got to be a better way. And so uh, will SPACs become the, uh, you know, the next asset class to Bitcoin on a retail level that becomes more understood as more attention and, you know, I don't know, winners emerge because it's still under the radar, relatively speaking. Yeah, I, think it, it has. I think that's that process is well underway. I think yeah. you see Citadel, Millennium, some of these larger firms are buying 5% of every deal as a place to park cash, get a free look. It's a no-brainer for for funds with too much money. I mean, if I were Kathy Wood at Arc, I'd be parking a lot of money in SPACs as opposed to chasing Tesla and other things that I think are just egregiously valued. But that's me. Well, she said I uh, <laughs> recently she has some money in SPACs. I don't watch her day to day, you know, transactions, but I'm sure that she's got. Well, she um, comes barreling in on deal announcement. Yeah. And and I think she participated in in Kappa um, recently at uh, in the pipe. And incidentally, I mean, there's an example. I own Kappa. Um, I've been buying more common. I like the deal. That's right. She did and, say and, and, and right now why. Yep. It's going down. I mean, RSVA Rogers Silicon Valley is another deal that I I did sell some units, and I've been buying common. Um, recently it's, it's dropped, it shot from 16 to 20, 28 on the common. I think the units got up to as high as 34. I was long from the tens. I sold a bunch in the thirties and I've coming back to the common. It's, uh, I didn't mention like when I sold the uh, ACIC units, um, I maintained my position by buying a certain amount of warrants. So I don't necessarily exit because I'll forget them. So I buy warrants to remember. And, and in the event that the stock soars, the warrant will, will move with it. So I take a lot of capital out. I reallocate the capital into safer uh, bets, but I maintain a, a position by buying warrants. So again, it's, it's, I don't really have a strategy that I could right in, in, a, in a memo and circulate it wouldn't be understood by anybody but but me um but there's those are a few examples kappa rsva of names that i actually like them and and i think over time regardless of the market they they shake super hard but i think over time they trend up into the right um a few names that i've that i bought recently um, just because they're they're from the class of 2019, DFNS, AMHC, and uh, the last few days, CHPM. Um, those three from the class of 2019 have very good managements. I'm a little mystified as to why they are taking so long to find a deal, but the flip side is they they only have uh, 
six, seven months to deliver. And for me, why not? Risk is minimal. The common shares on uh, DF and S have dropped down to 1030. I, I actually broke my rule and I paid around 11 for some of them. Uh, and they're not units, these are common, which I don't typically buy common. I made some exceptions that's, on these. Yeah, that's and, the question. Craig, do you split units when commons and warrants start trading separately or just keep the units? Yeah, I would recommend most people split them right away, the first day. I don't, but I would <laughs> recommend Do what I it. say, not as I do. Got yeah, it. <laughs> sure. um, I see a question in here about rumors. 99% of the time I use the rumor to dump. GSAH, I dumped my entire position in the mid 15s to 16. Look, let's think about one thing. A SPAC valuation is based on $10. It's six at 15, it's a 50% appreciation and upwards. It, you have to think about that. A $10 billion deal is now a $15 billion deal. CCIV demonstrated that significantly. A $24 oh, yeah. billion dollar deal at 15, at 60, it was suddenly $100 billion. Well, they were willing to sell the company for $12 billion. The next day, it's worth $100 billion. They've never sold a car. Like, I'm sorry, but no. Will you buy in at CCIV at where it is now after a ginormous drop? Yeah, so from a pure trading perspective, to be honest, I did step in the market today in the 26s. Um, I bought small uh, enough to keep me interested, but I'm hoping that it drops lower. But those shares I will probably keep. I, I, I was in Miami recently and Palm Beach. Uh, I saw both their showrooms. The car is smoking, it's an amazing car. Like, why would anybody buy a Tesla if you can buy a Lucid? It's, it's in another league of beauty and the interior is awesome. Like everything about it's awesome. I, I'm but hoping. the stock price is not awesome. <laughs> no, so that's, look, the, there was a guy on TV, I, I think yesterday I heard him talking about Amazon, that during the last fair market, Amazon, uh, or back in 2000, maybe the stock went from 100 to 6, but the revenue tripled. So good stock, bad company, good stock, good company, good company, bad stock, good company, great stock. Like, there's all kinds of scenarios, right? I don't know, but How do you over time, this is going to be good. What's that? So, uh, so yeah, Bob, you're, you're uh, knife catching, but still um, with a thesis. Um, it, a question of how do you position size, not only for your favorites, because um, I know you, you, you do trade around and you do have a lot of positions on, but for your favorites being athletic, um, altimeter and RTP, for mm -hmm. example, what percentage of available equity do you invest in those types of trades? Um, you know, I'm not going to answer that. I'll say that it's, it's unique to your pocketbook. Always. And, and if I were in my twenties and I had little responsibility, I would, I, and I'll tell you what I used to do. I, there, I mean, there was a time I went a hundred percent in one deal and it, and it literally went, uh, 40 fold in six months. That's concentrated. And, and, and that's when I decided not to be a lawyer. I mean, it's a true story. And, uh, and from there, I started probably 10 to 15% positions. And then over the years, it's gotten smaller and smaller. I, I would say that if you're not putting at least one to 2%, you're, you're maybe wasting your time. You're not going to move the needle. So you do have to, to take some risk. And uh, I'll give a range you know, as low as 1%. And sometimes uh, it could be maybe as high as 10%. So you fall into that. There are old traders, there are bold traders, but there are no bold old traders. <laughs> no, no more slinging 100% of equity in one particular no, no, concentrated I mean, play. It's, right. it's when you're young and you have no risk or no responsibilities and you can pivot quickly. I would take risk all day long. I would do it again. Well, As right you get now, older, you have to manage risk more appropriately. And especially, again, in this crazy interest rate environment where we've had no opportunity to, to capitalize on fixed income. I'll be brutally honest. I liquidated a very large fixed income portfolio 
that I had had for about 15 years. And I plowed it all in the SPACs in the low tens units. The portfolio has returned. I mean, it's comical. I was getting yeah. three to 4%. It's returned 15, 20, 30%. So what percentage do you think this is, or, or I should say, we've already talked about still the, the SPAC mania of supply, but still as an asset class, uh, relatively new and Bitcoin became really an asset class last year, right? So now institutional sponsorship is more vocal and press and all of that. Maybe a question for you, George, you've been doing this for a while, watching this rise, if you will, um, to fame. And it's not a one hit wonder. You're definitely not saying it's 1999, maybe in valuations and issuance, but not as it relates to its, you know, its uh, durability. H how much longer do you think it's going to take before it becomes really front and center as a, as a, as a position in uh, portfolios, a solid one, a solidly, let's just say, you know, concentrated one? I think it's here. I mean, look, all these deals that have two years. So for at least two years, if, if no SPAC issuance occurs from today forward, you've got 500 vehicles, 450 vehicles for the next two years that will trade. It's not going away, there's too many. We've never had this many. There's never been this much talk on TV. But there's still not a lot of understanding and it's, that's why we're doing this. I mean, the units, the warrants, the common, the issuance. Um, that's, the that's true. Yeah. Um, at, Jonathan is asking any recommended resources on best practices for trading the warrants after a merger? Again, warrant is where all the risk is. I de-risk by selling units and I'll take a certain percentage of the profit. So it's the house's money and buy, buy warrants. I mean, the warrant typically, uh, George, they've been pretty much 1150, right? So if the common is 10 bucks, in theory, the warrant's worthless, right? But what it has is a time value. And that time value, George, do you know the range? 50 cents, 80 cents? From warrant trading? So full warrants tend to trade, and this is, this is also levered to equity market performance, but full warrants, if the stock is trading 10 bucks, have generally traded north of two. So they're out of the money. So their intrinsic is of course not there, but they still have time value. So they still effectively have, you know, uh, they, they have the opportunity value. Um, and uh, and most warrants do trade as a full warrant, meaning even if the unit issued with a fifth of a warrant, um, it actually issued with um, a fifth of a warrant, you had to buy five units and then you owned a warrant. So they all, most of them trade that way. Um, in bad markets, picking up on what Craig noted, um, that all changes and those ranges decline because, because market expectation of rebounding is lower. Um, but ultimately owning a warrant after the business combination is almost the same. It's not mathematically the same because they have different uh, uh, functions, but it is almost the same as owning an option. It's just elongated option, typically five years post business combination. So if you think the market's gonna rebound and the company itself is a good company, um, that's been a really great way for investors to, uh, to put less money to work across a larger set of interesting um, companies. And when the market turns, if it turns, make a lot of money. But and that, that plays in my suggestion to build a, a warrant list and, and be prepared to just buy a blanket basket of them without thinking too much at the right price. Really? All right. That's that. That's the leap, or the, the kind of penny stock meets leap options. Um, no, and, and you don't really differentiate as far as your faves. You're just kind of like. No, no, no. I'm not. I'm not doing that now. I'm saying if we get into a, an ugly market that lasts. Okay. Once a year we, okay. or two years, like I don't want to say it, but that's what I believe. When, when this turns, it's not gonna be a quick turn. It's gonna be an ugly, painful turn. Uh, there will be a, significant, a big opportunity to capitalize on a basket of warrants. We're not there, obviously. Okay, all right. But I'm talking into the future. I'm saying, do your homework, right? And 
Greg is asking, any thoughts for selling the news or holding once the DA is announced? Deal. And uh, I've seen many, many large gains evaporate after what I thought was a solid DA or just seeing the SPAC price slowly drift lower after it's announced over the next couple of weeks and months. It's, you know, it's not, once, once a deal is announced, it's no longer a strategy. You have to review the PowerPoint and, and make a decision. Is this something that I want to own or not? And many deals shake like Fisker broke 10 and then rocketed higher. And, and I know some people that loved Fisker and were all over it in the nines or wherever it went to. And, and are sitting pretty, or something today are, so. are pretty happy right now. So it's, it's, I, I don't think post announcement, there's a strategy. It's come up with a valuation and buy it or not. And then from there, we all have strategies, right? Some people cut a loss at 10%, others keep buying um, as stocks decline and are willing to hold at losses and Again, we, we think something's going to 50, that's at 10 and, and at five, we still think it's going to 50, so we buy more. All right, so this might be a little, let's do rapid fire if you can, because it, it is um, a few yeah, I got about figures are coming in. Yeah, let's just do a quick, um, for those who want to get Craig's thoughts on some tickers. Well, let, let, let me throw out a few names that, that I think are interesting that oh, have not been announced that have come down. Um, I really like N-O-A-C-U, um, it's natural order. Uh, everybody's heard of Beyond Meat. This is a great team, they're focused in the space. I think I mentioned it last time. I think the unit was maybe in the, uh, I think it was right around 11. So unfortunately it's at 12 uh, right now, but it's one to, to watch if it continues to decline. It's, a, it's an amazing team. and. And we're hoping that they come up with something better than beyond. And unlike some of these deals that have announced and subsequently declined, that this enters a, a multi-year bull market. Uh, HSAQ, uh, ironically, it's a Chardon deal. Um, top notch, this is in the health science area. It's, it's called health science acquisition. Amazing team. Almost everything they've touched publicly has turned to gold. Um, I really like it. CP. CPUH.U. I mean, I'm shocked that this thing's come down as hard as it has um, in the 10, 1060 range, former CEO of Medtronic, board member of Intel. This guy knows where, where the cheese is. Uh, he's going to find something. Will it be good? I don't know. But at this, in, in the 1050 zone, it's, it's a, one that you, to me, you have to own. Another great in the healthcare space, Tumeric Acquisition, TMPMU, amazing team. Um, I really like it. Uh, PRSRU, another one I'm shocked, Prospector Capital, former CEO uh, and uh, executive chairman of Qualcomm. I, I would argue he knows every single 5G, every AI, all kinds of semiconductor companies. The stock was 12 bucks two days ago, or the unit, it's collapsed to 1060. I was trying to buy it. What was it? Close. The ticker again, PR what? P-R-S-R-U. Got it, okay. I mean, again, I don't know how people allocate their capital, but for sure it's, it's something that you, you should be wrong. Um, no, that's investment advice. I can't say that I own that. You're excited uh, about it. We got it. I'm excited about <laughs> it. Um, in, in the energy space, you got ENVIU, um, Can Accord Banking Team. Of course, they know where the deals are. A uh, couple that I bought today, um, I've been waiting for, for them to come in, XPDIU. Uh, I paid a little bit higher than, than what I'd like to, but I've, I've entered the position. XP, um, what was it? XPDIU. Got it. Um, ENNVU, another one that I had been waiting for it to come in and it crashed through 11 down to the 1070 zone. I started nibbling. Um, ACII, which is the second MOLA steel, the first one, ACIC announced Archer. Um, 
I bought more of this today. Uh, I've got a boatload of it. AGCB, uh, the altimeter deal yesterday dropped into the low 11s. I added to it. My basis is higher than here. I don't care. I'm willing to swing the bat at, uh, at a Gerstner deal. Um, broad scale acquisition, Sam, Charlie, Larry, Echo, Uncle, S-C-L-E-U is another one with some super strong um, PEVC guys. I'm shocked that it's collapsed, but across the board, everything's collapsed. And whereas many people are crying, I'm excited because these are names that I didn't buy on day one because they were above my buy parameter and they've all come into the zone. STPC.U is another one that was trading 1280, it's down to 1150. I need it to come a little lower, but it's on my list. The first deal star peak has been, has been a barn burner. Mm -hmm. So these guys know where to look. Um, a couple other names, uh, A-R-K-I-U, that's come down. I like the team. Uh, it's, it's down about 10, 1030. Um, E-T-A-C-U, I like the team. It's, it's uh, I think it's a June or July of last year class. It's come, come down dramatically. Uh, I like it. Um, uh, TDAC, lottery.com, lots of people have asked me about that. I haven't put out a PowerPoint, but they, they provided some revenue projections. If you think about it, Wall Street loves gambling. Wall Street loves revenue growth. This name fits the bill going forward. What was um, the ticker again? E-T-A-C-U? Uh, T, Tom David Applecat, Trident Acquisition. Uh, this one has, I call it a super warrant. It's, it's a full warrant. So if the stock goes to, to 20, the warrant's 850 or higher. If it goes to 30, the warrant is uh, minus 1150 is 18 bucks. It's, it's two and change. Uh, this company, you know, I'll sell lottery tickets around the world. I'm excited. I like to play the lottery. And you do not. You know your odds. I do. I love it. I love it <laughs> you're, you're a student of math. Zero. You know no statistically play. what your chances are. <laughs> Five bucks a week. I do oh it. Oh, my God. <laughs> my grandpa always did it, and he told me if I didn't play, I can't win. Oh my gosh. So, you know, if these guys get into to any, I don't know, we can take any more advice from you, Craig. <laughs> I don't offer advice. I say what I'm doing or what I like or what makes me excited. Oh, that's funny. Okay. Um, you know, the, the, the list is endless. I've thrown out about 10 plus deals. Uh, NXU, I think it is. Uh, no. Uh, it's a second deal of, uh, Starts with an N. K I N Z U, if I mention that one, uh, is another one. I really like the team. I said A R K I U K I N Z U. G Square, G S Q D. Go to their, just go to their uh, website, G Squared.com, um, a VC guy. They've, they've uh, invested in almost every super high profile deal. What I was that again? G what? G squared, G S Q D. I think QD. it's it's a yep, name, it. it's a name to watch. Uh, D L C A U, another name to watch. Um, I like this warrant, G L A Q W. It's Globus. It's a full warrant. Uh, G L A Q U. I think I mentioned it to you at IPO date. It was ten bucks. Mm -hmm. Ten ten twenty. You could have bought it. It recently hit eleven twenty. That's uh, that's ten percent right there. You could have bought the unit for 1020 when I recommended it to you. You could have sold the common at 1020 and, and now you'd have a free warrant. Another strategy, take the units at 10 bucks or 1010, wait for them to split, blow out the common, keep the warrant for free, no brainer. Um, do it all day long. Um, things I don't like, SOAC, I saw this uh, announcement, a rumor, I dumped it. Uh, it was, I forget the name of, of the company, but I quickly looked it up. I did some quick research, uh, made a few phone calls. Uh, not for me, staying away. We'll see what happens if, if they ultimately announce the deal. Uh, ALTU rumor, I dumped my stock. 
got up into the 14s and I think the 15s on the unit is where I blew it out. Um, love the concept of a uh, supersonic plane. I'm tired of uh, flying east to west in five, six hours, west to east. Um, I love it. Uh, valuation, who knows, rumor, who knows. I, I started to nibble some common back and then I decided to wait because of the market. Uh, is, is not where, where I want to be. Someone's asking about Howard Lindzen and Slack U. Uh, you know, uh, Howard Lindzen. Um, he's a smart guy. He, he's got a lot of contacts. Um, I like guys who are also operators and, and real VCs. And uh, at the right price, I will enter Slack U at, uh, at 11 plus. It's not happening. Um, and especially in this market environment, it's not where I want to be. Um, PACXU, it's a, it's a huge position of mine. I love this team. Um, I was throwing out new names. I think I may have mentioned PACXU on the last call. Um, you know, uh, uh, I own it higher. Uh, I, I violated my discipline on my basis is 1070. And it's 1045 on the unit right now. Uh, I'll buy more. I like it. Um, I did buy the SRNGU. I, I stepped in yesterday. I bought what I thought was a full position at 1077. Uh, these are the DraftKings and Skills guys. They're, they obviously know the game as well as anybody. Uh, it, it broke below my price. Um, and, and I will definitely buy more if it continues lower. You know, when I noticed the market starting to turn south, uh, and I think I tweeted it out, I blew out of, I, I was long Tama Brava. I blew out of a lot of that in the, in the mid 12, I think 1270. No, you, no warrant. I don't like that. Um, it's you don't now like it, that it doesn't have a warrant? Yeah, I like warrants. That, that, that okay. protects my risk. Um, so I blew out of most of that at, at, at uh, 1270. I kept half, my base is 1147. I'm not going to do anything in the name right now. If it goes below, I'll buy more. And if not, I'm, I'm okay with half a position because now there's lots of opportunities. Um, one what about that I just, the two that um, Greg mentioned, bought by uh, ARC, CMLF and BFLY? I mean, those are good companies. They've had big runs, definitely ones to, to keep on the radar. Uh, ARC also, uh, I don't own those right now. ARC, ARC also did Kappa, and I've been a buyer of Kappa. I like it. Um, RAACU, Steve Case deal announced yesterday. Robots, I like it. I mean, I think the commons were 15. The unit should be higher. It, it didn't get there. Um, the market turned down. Um, yeah, but you recommended that back on January 20th. I have this in here as an 18.5% gain since then. Just from your recommendation. Yeah, but it's it's probably higher because yesterday uh, it was. Oh no, it uh, topped it out at fourteen fifty and fell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was a forty percent. I did sell some at uh, fourteen seventy, so I did uh, realize the full return on on that one. Are you um, still in DNMR? Uh, Danima, I I'm not. Basic no. materials, been so, no. Okay. No, I, I love the name, but again, it ran to sixty and and it exceeded all valuation parameters and. Unfortunately, I stick to my discipline. It's just, it's what I got to do. Are you um, still, I, I'm still RSVA. It tagged 28, came right back I've been a down. buyer. Yeah, I've been a buyer then. Yeah. I, I sold some units and I've been buying common. I mentioned that earlier. I like it. Um, LNFA, it's it's kind of a un, under the radar. It's it's in the legal space. Uh, it's got the former CEO of Kirk and Ellis. Ah, He's yes, definitely yes, yes. a smart dude. And, and I'm in, I like it. And then another one that's definitely under the radar. Uh, I've been a, a recent buyer and, and got a little bit more aggressive today. Tom, Zebra, Paul, Sam, Uncle, private equity guys. Um, maybe they look in Israel, maybe not, but under the radar, I like it. Nobody's talking about it. Ditto the LNFA. Uh, PTK I mentioned, I think I may have mentioned before. Um, I, I still oh. love that team and I'm, I'm hoping that they bring us a very strong semiconductor deal. Uh, 
chip shortage. The, chip shortage. <laughs> well, one of the guys there was uh, he was the chairman of Cypress, which was uh, TJ mm -hmm. Rogers' deal, which is RSVA. I don't know what they'll bring us or what they won't. Um, it's a team I've never communicated with, although I, I would have liked to. Uh, SVOK, I still love this deal, Seven Oaks. Um, we'll see what they bring us. Um, unfortunately, I got to run in, in five minutes. So no worries, we hit it I all. I wanted to go cool. over your uh, list and any, uh, any. I did buy I did buy hugs today. H U G S dot U. Uh, the Shake Shack guys. I bought uh, about a third of a position just just to have my toe in it. Um, another European one. I I A C. I, I like a lot. Um, we'll see what happens there. Uh, I think I mentioned Malarca Straits on the last call. Disappointing uh, Netflix of Indonesia. Sounds like a bunch of nonsense to me. I blew all that out this morning. The Warren, I paid a buck 40, sold it at a uh, buck 90 to 204. Uh, so it was a decent return, but disappointing for sure. Uh, Ledecky, anything Ledecky, he, he moves quick. So PICC.U. Um, it's under 1050. It's relatively riskless. He's seemingly announced deals within two months. So uh, that's when I throw out there. PNTM, another European, very strong team. I mean, some of these I'm, I'm surprised we're having this opportunity, but we are. Let's capitalize on it. I am. Um, and uh, oh, just working at warp speed. I mentioned CSLEU. Um, broad scale, I think you, you got to own that. Ah, Lindsen's deal. Um, SRSAU, I don't know what this is, but I'm in it. Uh, Sarissa Capital, it's another uh, in the in the med tech space. What is it again? CR? S -R Sam Romeo, Sam Apple Uncle. Got it. Strong team, I, I, I love it. Um, you know, maybe I'll look back and say I should have sold the units at 1260. Uh, since they're 1190 now and maybe on their way to 1050, but who knows? Um, another one that's gotten a lot of rumors lately, YAC.U, Ron Burkle. Um, I didn't sell any of the units. They ran up over 1280. I'm in, in the tens. They're down to 1130. Guy's a billionaire. I got to roll with him. On that note. That's uh, awesome. I think that's good. You know, maybe we'll do a, a, a SPAC attack three down the road. Because I kept your, you know, I'm your available list. whenever. They were awesome. And I have definitely, um, you know, with clients in my live trading room, kept this. And for those who are into it, sized it up. But no, uh, it's, it's very interesting because you are doing a lot of the due diligence. Some are doing their own. And it's nice when they align. It's killing me. I'm honest. Uh, it's rare in this business. I've been in, in the equities investment management space for 26 years now. Uh, I mean, it's funny. Somebody reached out to me on Twitter recently that screwed me uh, 25 years ago when I first entered the business. And, and then he reached out to me on LinkedIn. I blocked him, which I rarely do. Like I, I can take the abuse and, and the punches. It, it goes no, really you can't time. let the barking dogs don't distract you. <laughs> I'll never talk to you again. Um, somebody's asking real quick on HPX. Fingers crossed they're in Brazil. Valuations are very attractive down there. Uh, they remain attractive. I'll post, there's two other uh, deals that recently floated. I think to make a, a nice uh, basket, um, both are viable, both have strong managements. I've contacted people in Brazil, um, they're good. Let's hope that uh, that HPX brings us a unicorn. It, it's a definite possibility, in which case it'll do really well. And if they don't, they'll bring us a deal we won't lose because we're in it. Uh, I own units, I think under under $10 actually. Um, so when when these things were really out of favor, uh, yeah, in one account I own units at 1007 and elsewhere I think at 996, um, no, 1004, I'm sorry. Um, right. This is awesome, so thank you. I gotta Jonathan. fly, maybe George can keep going. I'm, I think we've done this I'm before. We've so. always went over um, the five o'clock hour. It's already 525. So I think we're all going to call it kind of a night. And I want to thank you. Well, you got some extra time being on the West Coast. But thank you again for your um, introduction to George, your highlights of not Those only top picks, but also your risks. 
um, that you see to the space. And most importantly, uh, you know, just sizing it up as it's not just, you know, 2000 euphoria, there actually is a business case for more retail to subscribe, especially with, like you said, the late stage investment and private equity money that's just looking for a home. And George, thank you for describing. Yeah, I got to run. Yeah, thank you so much. Good Both much. gentlemen, I'm going to say thank you for attending. Have a great evening. <laughs> Bye. George, thank you so much for popping into it. To this, this is the second time you've been um, really on the banking side, able to uh, kind of give a really detailed and nuanced um look at this space i really want to thank you for your time absolutely thanks a lot all right and everyone thank you again for joining i will post this to leduc uh trading channel which is my youtube channel we'll get that up there that way you can rewind and yes he flew through a whole bunch of tickers um and i did add them to a watch list but long story short you'll have to uh, kind of re-listen and then track them yourself good luck and uh hope to see you next next time have a great evening everyone thank you